Okay, this is uh, uh, Principles of Management at Newberry College, Fall 2021. Uh, this is Part 2 <coughs> of Unit 5, uh, which, remember, is uh, Chapter 5 in the 10th edition of the book and Chapter 6 in the 11th edition of our textbook. Uh, and where we left off last time was with uh, beginning to discuss competitive benchmarking. Uh, competitive benchmarking is one of the most important things that an organization, uh, and particularly its managers, can do uh, in order to uh, try to assess uh, your competitive situation and how you might respond to competitive challenges. How can you beat the other guy? Uh, and it's, it's a little bit like studying film on your opponents. Uh, before you play them in a game. So uh, uh, if you can uh, legally uh, and honestly assess uh, what your competitors' strengths and weaknesses are and then try to improve on their strengths uh, maybe by, you know, 5 or 10% and, and avoid their weaknesses, uh, you can have uh, a huge advantage and you can leapfrog your competitors in the marketplace uh, if you do this uh, you know, diligently uh, <clears throat> and um, regularly. And, and so that's uh, uh, competitive benchmarking uh, really got its start uh, in the late 1970s, uh, early 1980s. And the example that the book uses uh, is uh, from 1979 with the Xerox copiers. Uh, Xerox had been such a market leader uh, that Xerox really became one of those words that was synonymous with copying. But uh, Japanese competitors uh, during the 1970s uh, were able to come into the American market and offer uh, Xerox's quality uh, at lower prices than Xerox's price. And so Xerox sent a team to Japan that discovered that the Japanese had benchmarked Xerox's product quality but use manufacturing techniques that eliminated waste and inefficiency and help them lower their costs so they could offer a lower price uh, and still uh, make a profit. And so Xerox adopted Japanese manufacturing techniques and tried to improve on them as well, you know, that 5% better. And Xerox's strategic turnaround saved its copier business. Now, benchmarking doesn't have to be part of a strategic turnaround strategy for a company in trouble. It can also be uh, part of a business plan for a new business, too. Uh, the three-meeting technique uh, in drafting wills that I talked about last time uh, was part of my law firm's initial strategy, and it still serves us well. Although with COVID, we've turned the uh, second meeting into a conference call, and sometimes even the first meeting, too. Uh, however, for the, the third meeting, we can't docusign wills yet. Uh, so we have to have a sit-down execution for the wills and the uh, powers of attorney. Let's move on to uh, looking at one of our other objectives uh, in the chapter, uh, how do managers set goals and develop plans? Uh, and you see the example of traditional goal setting on one hand and then management by objectives, or what they uh, often abbreviate as MBO, uh, on the other hand, uh, and this is in uh, uh, traditional goal setting you see in Exhibit 5-5 in the 10th edition and Exhibit 6-5 in the 11th edition. Uh, and you can see examples of when the traditional method goes wrong, uh, and uh, then there's a discussion of the means end change, uh, reversing the direction uh, to get an employee buy-in on the goal. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Management by objectives, that's a process of setting mutually agreed upon goals uh, between management uh, and employees and then using those goals to evaluate employee performance. So planning equals goals plus plans. Uh, so uh, uh, goals are objectives, uh, the desired outcomes. Uh, plans are the documents that outline how the goals are going to be met. Uh, note the different Note that there can be a difference between an organization's stated goals and its real goals. Uh, the stated goals are contained in official documents, 
but you can tell the organization's real goals by what it actually does. Now, you know, this, this is kind of a uh, ethically challenging uh, topic uh, because the book certainly acknowledges uh, that you can have a hidden agenda, which seems a little bit unethical. Uh, you know, it seems as though truth and honesty ought to be uh, a part of uh, uh, planning, uh, but sometimes uh, you can't disclose your real goals, uh, and sometimes uh, sometimes you have to hide them. Uh, so a little bit like a trick play, maybe in in sports. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> in any event, uh, let's assume that sometimes there are ethical ways, um, because of competitive pressures, uh, to uh, uh, differentiate between stated goals and real goals. And sometimes it's just an example of malfeasance and, and something that you want to avoid. So uh, in any event, be careful about that. Uh, note the dialogue in the fifth exhibit in the chapter, the one that looks like a pyramid. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, top-down. This is, this is the traditional goal-setting method. Uh, top management starts by saying, uh, we need to improve the company's performance. And then the division manager say, I want to see a significant improvement, regardless of the means. And I want to see a significant improvement in this division's performance. And then the department managers say, let's increase profits, regardless of the means. And then the individual employees say, don't worry about the quality, just work faster. Uh, you know, kind of like the production line. Uh, that, that's an example of traditional goal setting gone very, very wrong. It's like a bad game of children's telephone where each person in the chain repeats the message until it gets jumbled when it gets back around to the person who first said it in the beginning. It reminds me of the Wells Fargo scandal, in which a top management decision to increase cross-selling of bank products to good customers ended up with individual employees being incentivized to create phony accounts in order to meet sales goals and earn bonuses. That's the place where a healthy corporate culture and a means and chain can reverse the direction of the goals so that healthy and sustainable means become the tools that allow top level goals to be achieved. See the discussion in the book which gives the example of DJ Orthopedics of Mexico as an organization in which individual employees can see the effects of their actions on the overall business unit's goal. That's how traditional goal setting is supposed to work. Management by objective often abbreviated as MBO, isn't a new concept. It was identified by Peter Drucker back in the 1950s. Uh, there's a short chapter about it in a book I have called The Essential Drucker. Uh, I've, I have, well, I will post a copy of that chapter in your resources. I actually haven't had a chance to copy it yet. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, if you want to read about, you know, a good 10-page summary of the MBO concept in Drucker's own language. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's easy reading, it's very straightforward. Uh, and uh, uh, there's also a good short summary in your book called From the Past to the Present in the 10th edition. It's called Classic Concepts in Today's Workplace in the 11th edition. That's the only thing that's different is the title on the box uh, in the display uh, in the chapter. So. Uh, uh, your uh, authors are very creative uh, in terms of their updating of their work. Uh, the information is identical in both editions. Absolutely critical to the success of MBO, Management by Objective Programs, is top management commitment to the process. When top managers have a high commitment to MBO and are personally involved in its implementation, productivity gains are higher than without that commitment. That's scientifically verifiable, and it has been for decades. Okay, steps in setting goals. Uh, number one, I'm going to run out of fingers here. There's six steps. Uh, review the organization's mission and employees' key job tasks. That's the first thing to do. So review the mission and the employees' key job tasks. Two, evaluate the available resources. Three, Determine the goals individually or with input from others. Four, make sure the goals are well written and then communicate them to all who need to follow. Five, build in feedback mechanisms to assess goal project. 
And six, link rewards to goal attainment. Okay, that's the steps in setting goals. Uh, what are well-written goals? They're written in terms of outcomes rather than actions. <clears throat> They're measurable and quantifiable. They're clear as to time frame. <clears throat> They're challenging yet attainable. Uh, and of course, they're written down. They have to be written. If they're not written down, uh, you know, you only remember, what is it, about 20 or 30 percent of what you hear. Uh, you remember 60, 70 percent of what you read. If you write them down, you can 100 percent of the time go back and read them again. And they're communicated to all necessary organizational members. Types of plans. Uh, you can have plans that are differentiated in terms of time frame, you know, short term and then long term, uh, specificity, uh, you know, directional or specific, uh, frequency of use, single use versus standing plans, and breadth. Are they strategical or are they, are they strategic? Are they tactical or operational? <coughs> contemporary planning issues. What are the contemporary planning issues? Well, uh, you know, two of them are uh, dynamic environments, uh, plans that are specific but flexible. So <clears throat> you can have a plan that is specific, uh, but in which you retain flexibility uh, to respond uh, to dynamic environments. In the example of our law firm, uh, our plan, the three meeting method, uh, we've been flexible enough to be able to respond to the COVID crisis, uh, and, you know, having to wear a mask all the time uh, by, uh, uh, you know, being able to substitute a conference call uh, or maybe a Zoom call uh, for uh, one or more of the meetings. Environmental scanning, detecting emerging trends <coughs> by scanning large amounts of information. So you're, you're scanning the environment, you're, you're, you know, assessing the whole field of battle. <coughs> and competitive intelligence, uh, studying competitors to anticipate their actions rather than having to react to them. Now, there are legal and ethical limits to the amount and type of competitive intelligence that can be uh, accessed. Don't cross the line. Uh, <coughs> if you start sicking, you know, uh, uh, private investigators on your uh, competitors or, you know, trying to hack into their uh, uh, electronic systems, uh, you've crossed the line uh, in, in all likelihood. Uh, <clears throat> maybe not with the private investigators. Uh, you know, many of them are quite ethical themselves. Uh, but, uh, you know, spying, bugging, that sort of thing uh, is wrong. <clears throat> Reading Forbes and the Wall Street Journal for good examples of what your competitors are doing, uh, learning from their case studies, uh, learning uh, perhaps from going to industry seminars, uh, hiring consultants uh, who sometimes can ethically uh, identify for you uh, what your competitors are doing, uh, maybe because they have access to a broader range of data. Uh, those are ways uh, that uh, might allow you to <coughs> keep your, your ethical values intact uh, and still identify uh, those competitive niches where you can uh, find an advantage for yourself or develop one for yourself. <clears throat> so, uh, contemporary planning issues facing managers, uh, uh, you can have dynamic environments and crisis situations, uh, rapidly changing external environments create uncertainty in planning and the risk of failure to address changes effectively. Crisis situations can block an organization's ability to plan until the crisis is resolved. We have to fix the past or the present before we can address the future. That's, that's, an, that's an issue that comes up uh, quite frequently uh, <clears throat> in these scandal situations that you read about. So, uh, you know, when there's a crisis, a lot of times all you can do is focus on the crisis. Uh, you can't really, uh, you know, get back and, and start driving toward the future. And uh, <clears throat> with environmental scanning, um, that's the competitive intelligence, do it well and ethically, and take advantage of big data uh, to mine for opportunities. And, uh, <coughs> you know, if you're going to build a better mousetrap, make sure it's legal. Uh, avoid piracy and invasion of privacy. Well, that's it for the uh, 
uh, Unit 5 material. Again, it is a very meaty chapter and, and certainly took more than a half hour <coughs> to discuss appropriately. Uh, we have another one coming up uh, in the uh, next unit, uh, Unit 6, and we will get to that uh, in the next lecture. Until then, have a great day, and we'll talk again soon.